Okay, I see that we have a number of people on the line. So hello, my name is Karthi and I'm joining you from uh, the New York headquarters with a warm welcome to everyone who's joined us here today for another Children AIDS Learning Collaborative webinar. Today, we will be hearing more about the latest science on HIV and children, adolescents, and pregnant women presented at the 12th International AIDS Society Conference on HIV Science, held from the 23rd to the 26th of July. We're getting this detailed glimpse of the studies and insights presented last month in Brisbane, Australia, through the expert voice of Dr. Lynn Mofinson. Dr. Mofinson is the technical advisor to the research program at the Elizabeth Glazer Pediatric AIDS Foundation. She retired after over 25 years of service at the NIH or the National Institutes of Health, where she was responsible for program planning and the development and scientific direction of research studies and clinical trials in the US and internationally on pediatric, adolescent, and maternal HIV infections. The Children and AIDS Learning Collaborative has been fortunate to have Dr. Muffinson with us to present the scientific webinar series over a number of years. I would also like to introduce Dr. Shafiq Asaji, Senior Advisor for HIV here at UNICEF, who will be available to answer questions and contribute to the discussion during the Q&A segment. Please feel free to add your questions to the Q&A box or to the chat box anytime during the presentation, and we will get to as many as we have time for after the one hour presentation is over. Um, as always, the slides and the recording will be available on childrenandaids.org. I'll also put this link in the chat box and they'll be available later today. Thank you again for joining us here today. Um, without further delay, passing it to Dr. Muffinson, please start your presentation when you're ready. Sure. Okay. Can everyone see? Yes. Okay. So good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone, wherever you are. Uh, I'm going to present selected abstracts from the AIDS 2023 conference and the pediatric HIV workshop that were held in uh, Brisbane, Australia a couple of weeks ago. And as always, I'm going to start with the UN AIDS update on the epidemiology of pediatric HIV that was presented at the pediatric workshop. So the good news is that over 3 million new infections in children um, have been averted with uh, ART and PMTCT programs since uh, 2000. Sorry, just one second, I'm trying to move this out of my way. Okay. Um, so what you see here is the number of new child infections in uh, the dark green and the number of infections averted due to PMTCT in the light green. And you can see cumulatively 3.4 million new infections have been averted in children due to maternal treatment. So that's the good news. However, ART coverage in pregnant and breastfeeding women has remained stalled since 2018. So this slide shows you the coverage of pregnant women who receive ARV for PMTCT. And if you look at 2018, coverage was 82%. And in 2021, coverage was 82%. So there's been no real change in maternal ART coverage since 2018. And this varies considerably by geographic region. You can see in East and Southern Africa, there's 93% coverage of, we, of uh, women receiving treatment for PMTCT. Whereas in West and Central Africa, lower prevalence areas, only 53% coverage was seen. And as a result, new child infections have only slightly decreased over time. And this shows you new infections in children under age 15 by year. And in 2022, there were 130,000 new pediatric HIV infections estimated to have occurred. And although this is a 58% decline from 2010, since 2015, shown in blue here, the new infection decrease has been only 10,000 a year to 200,000 in 2015, 190,000, 180, 70, 60, 50, 40, 30. 
So at this pace, to reach our 2020 target of 20,000 new infections a year, which we've already missed, it's going to take us more than a decade to reach that. So the causes of new children globally are shown here. Um, so globally, 65,000 new child infections, nearly 50%, still occur because pregnant women are not diagnosed and started on treatment, shown in orange. In red, you see infections due to new acquisition during pregnancy and breastfeeding, 20%. Then in green, mother didn't continue treatment during pregnancy or breastfeeding, 22%. And it's unusual for mother to be on treatment but not achieve viral suppression, only 9%. But this varies considerably regionally. And if we look at West and Central Africa on the right here, you can see that 67% in orange of new infections are due to lack of maternal treatment and only 12% due to incident infection. But if we move to Eastern and Southern Africa, we see only 29% are due to lack of maternal art and incident infections accounts for 29% of new vertical infections. Uh, this slide looks at the percent of HIV exposed children who were tested for HIV by age two months. So if we look at the orange line, we see that globally 68% of infants had early infant diagnosis by age eight weeks in 2022, which is a slight increase from 62% in 2021. In red, you see West and Central Africa, the generally lower HIV prevalence countries, and there EID actually decreased between 2019 and 2022, with current coverage being only 23%. In contrast, if we look in blue at EID in East and Southern Africa, high prevalence countries, you can see coverage continues to increase with current coverage being 83%. This slide shows you the coverage of people receiving treatment by age with uh, the adults in the lighter color, children in the uh, darker color, and you can see that there is a significant lower rate of art coverage in children than adults, 77% in adults, 57% in children. Additionally, 62% of children living with HIV who are not on treatment are estimated to be age 5 to 14 years. So HIV testing outside of early infant diagnosis is really critical, such as home or self-testing. This slide shows you progress for HIV testing and treatment, cascade targets, uh, people who know their status, on treatment and suppressed. And this is stratified by age with adults shown on the right, children on the left. And you can see that children lag behind adults in knowing their HIV status, 63 versus 83%, being on treatment, 57 versus 77%, and viral suppression, 46% versus 72%. And there are significant regional differences. And this looks specifically at Western and Central Africa. And here you can see that nearly two of every three children living with HIV are actually not receiving treatment. In contrast, three of every four adults with HIV are receiving treatment. And this last slide looks at new HIV infections in adolescents and young people aged 15 to 24, with females shown in the lighter green, males shown in the darker green. And although the annual rate of new infections in adolescents and young people has decreased by 65% from the peak in 1997, this decline has slowed to 10 to 20,000 a year in the last 10 years, as shown uh, in the different colors here. And adolescent girls and young women continue to have a 1.5 fold higher rate of new infection than adolescent boys and young men within 2022, 210,000 girls versus 140,000 boys. So I think the data from the epidemiology show that we have a lot of challenges and a lot of work still to do in terms of eliminating pediatric HIV infection. 
So I'm going to move to talk about the abstracts, starting with pediatric uh, treatment. So the first study I'm going to talk about is the New Horizon study, uh, which was presented as a poster. So the New Horizon Collaborative is focused on drug donation of darunavir, ritonavir, and atravirine by Johnson & Johnson for treatment of children with viral failure on treatment, and also building country health capacity for management of children with treatment failure. And data from seven of the New Horizon Collaborative countries, Cameroon, Eswatini, Kenya, Lesotho, Nigeria, Uganda, and Zambia. Um, their data on treatment management failure cascade was obtained from the country programs. So this is data on over 6,200 children failing on either protease inhibitor or dolutegravir-based treatment, with most coming from Uganda, 38%, or Kenya, 36%. Most of these children received enhanced adherence counseling and happily had viral resuppression, but this varied significantly between countries ranging from 88% in Eswatini to 42% in Cameroon. So children who had continued viremia were referred to technical country working groups for review and drug resistance test approval. And Uganda, shown in the darker brown, had the highest rates of drug resistance approval, but you see that only 60% of approved tests were actually collected, and only 50% of those actually received test results. And there were multiple challenges to drug resistance testing, including patient fees, lab capacity, and long turnaround for results. So these data show us that EIC, Enhanced Adherence Counseling, is a strong tool to achieve resuppression in children. Uh, and there is variability in management between countries and considerable access with uh, considerable challenges to access with drug resistance testing. Uh, this study is the CHAPIS-4, which is a randomized uh, factorial 4x2 open-label randomized trial looking at second-line treatment options for children in Uganda, Zambia, and Zimbabwe. It enrolled 919 children aged 3 to 15 years, failing on first-line uh, treatment, and then randomized them to receive for NN NRTIs, either TAF and FTC, or a Abacavir or Zidovudine plus 3TC. And then there was a second randomization to anchor drunk to anchor drug, either dolutegravir, darunavir, ritonavir, adizanavir, ritonavir, or lopinavir, ritonavir. This uh, shows you the characteristics of the children enrolled. 54% were male, median age 10 years, most asymptomatic with a reasonably good CD4 count of 669, viral load level of around 17,000, uh, um, with a decreased height for age and weight for age. First line NRTI was a back of at 53%, and the first line NNRTI was a Favarin's in 56%, uh, with the children being on treatment for almost six years on first line before failure. So this looks at virologic response defined as viral load less than 400 stratified by randomization. So if we first look at the NRTI backbone, you see that 89.4% uh, were suppressed with TAF uh, compared to 83.3% with the Bacavir or Zidovudine. And then if we look at the anchor drunk, we see that 92% suppression with uh, dolutegravir, 88.3% with darunavir, 84.3% with adizanavir, 80.7% with lopinavir. And then if we look at the percent difference and p-values, we see TAF was shown to be superior to abacavir or zidovudine with a difference of 6.3% between success. Dolutegravir was superior compared to, to lupinavir, ritonavir, or uh, adizanavir, ritonavir. Darunavir had a trend towards superiority to lopinavir or adizanavir, and adizanavir and lopinavir were non-inferior, basically the same. 
Uh, there was no difference in CD4 count by randomization, uh, no difference in AEs for the NRTI randomization. There were more grade three or four uh, AEs for adizanavir, ritonavir, mostly bilirubin than lopinavir. Dalutegravir had fewer grade uh, three, four AEs than lopinavir, ritonavir. And we'll see on the next slide, there was a greater increase in uh, BMD with TAF than uh, the other NRTIs, and an increase in total cholesterol and LDL with lopinavir, ritonavir versus the other drugs. Uh, so this looks at weight and BMI change for age, first focused on the NRTI randomization, and you can see TAF in red had a greater increase in both weight for age and BMI for age compared to abacavir or zidovudine. Looking at the anchor drug, we see that there was an increase in weight in all of the arms except for lopinavir, ritonavir, which either was stable or decreased over time. And then when they looked at whether there was a uh, interaction between people on dolutegravir and TAF compared to dolutegravir and abacavir or zidovudine, no interaction was seen. So weight gain was not greater in those who received dolutegravir TAF than those who got dolutegravir, abacavir, or zidovudine. So TAF was superior to standard of care abacavir or zidovudine. Dolutegravir was superior to second line protease inhibitors. Adizanavir was as good as lopinavir. Darunavir had a trend to be superior to the other PI regimens. And lopinavir ritonavir had the poorest weight gain and the least favored lipid profiles. And this suggests the need for child-friendly formulations of TAF, FTC, or 3TC, and dolutegravir, and darunavir or ritonavir or adizanavir ritonavir as the PI for second-line treatment. This study came from uh, the Baylor Pediatric AIDS Initiative in Tanzania and was a chart review from two sites in Tanzania of over a thousand children uh, less than 19 years on treatment for greater than six months. And so they followed up those who had an initial undetectable viral load to less than 50 and looked at those who had two or more viral loads after that initial uh, undetectable viral load. 51% were female, the mean age was 10, uh, mean age at start of treatment was 4, and 66% were on dolutegravir, 27% on protease inhibitors. So looking at the follow-up viral load after initial undetectable viral load, 318 children, or almost 48%, had low-level viremia, being uh, 50 to 199 and 53%, 200 to 399, 27%, and 400 to 999 in 20%. So if we then looked at the cumulative probability of viral failure, subsequent viral failure, by level of low-level viremia, you can see that there is a significant difference. Those who had no low-level viremia had a very low probability of viral failure, and the probability of viral failure increased uh, by level of low-level viremia. And this shows you the adjusted hazard ratio for factors associated with viral failure. And you can see compared to no low level viremia with the lowest level, there was a 1.7 fold uh, increase in viral failure uh, going up to a 3.3 fold increased risk with the highest level of low level viremia. Uh, age was also associated, nutritional status and CD4. So this shows us that low-level viremia was associated with an increased risk of viral failure in children with the higher low-level viremia levels, that is 400 to 999, associated with higher subsequent risk. And age, malnutrition, and um, low CD4 count were also associated with viral failure in this study. 
Uh, so this looks at an adult study that I think has relevance to children, and it's looking at HIV drug resistance uh, in adults. So this is a cross-sectional study in Mozambique of drug resistance post-treatment failure. They did a genotype on samples from 716 patients. And as I noted, although this was adults, one might expect to see similar things in children. So they looked at a very specific population, those on first-line treatment for 12 months or more before they switched to dilutegravir treatment um, and, and who had an unsuppressed viral load greater than 1,000 after more than six months on dilutegravir and as well a second unsuppressed viral load after completing at least three enhanced adherence counseling visits. So this is a very selected population of people having confirmed viral failure despite counseling uh, on uh, dilutegravir. So uh, 216 or 30% uh, had viral failure. Genotyping was done in 80%, mostly successful. And of those who had genotyping, 78% had pre dilutegravir viral load available. So this looks at resistance uh, by, by drug, and I'm going to focus on dilutegravir. And you can see that intermediate to high level dilutegravir resistance, that is the orange or the red, was seen in 35 of 167, or 21% of those with confirmed viral failure. 27% um, of those who had dilutegravir resistance had resistance to all three drugs uh, in the TLD regimen. Uh, those with two drug resistance did not have combined dilutegravir TDF, had a dilutegravir 3TC resistance. Uh, patients who had treatment failure and dilutegravir resistance were more likely to be unsuppressed or have no viral load than to be suppressed prior to the dilutegravir switch. So unsuppressed or um, uh, no viral load, 19%, 41% compared to those who were suppressed prior to switch, 11%. So in patients with confirmed viral failure on dilutegravir, 21% had resistance to dilutegravir, and those who had unsuppressed or no viral load done prior to dilutegravir switch had a higher risk of developing dilutegravir resistance. So this now looks at children, and this is a retrospective review of electronic medical record and genotype uh, from uh, the Baylor group in East Watini. The genotyping was done in South Africa um, between 2014 and 2023, and this is 251 art experienced children aged uh, 0 to 24 years who had two or more detectable viral loads while on protease or uh, dilutegravir-based treatment. 61% um, were males. Uh, the majority were on protease inhibitor-based treatment at the time of viral failure and genotyping. And this looks at drug susceptibility by, um, by regimen. So if we first start in the orange box with the NRTIs, we see that 50% of these children had high level resistance to 3TC, most from the M184V mutation. In the blue box, we see NNRTIs. And despite the fact none of these were on NNRTIs at the time that they were genotyped, 50% had high level resistance to NRTIs, and including one third who had high level resistance to rilpivirine. Then if we look at the protease inhibitors in purple, 20% had intermediate to high level resistance to protease inhibitors. Now you'll note that darunavir ritonavir resistance was less common than adizanavir or lopinavir. And then if we look at integrase inhibitors of the 13 patients that were receiving dilutegravir, two or 15% had intermediate to high dilutegravir resistance. So this shows the importance of pediatric drug resistance surveillance to optimally inform future effective art regimens and also shows us that dilutegravir resistance can occur in people who fail dilutegravir. 
This moves to looking at uh, integrase inhibitor use in over 7,800 children in follow-up in um, the EPIC study. Um, uh, proportion receiving integrase inhibitors increased from 1% in 2015 to 22% in 2020, highest in Western Europe. Um, of the 1,811 children who ever received an integrase inhibitor, 60% received dolutegravir, 29% received raltegravir, 176 or 10% el elvitegravir, and only 1% bictegravir. The median age at integrase inhibitor start was 13 years with variability across the drugs, raltegravir having the largest proportion starting less than six. Uh, the median uh, was six to 10 years on treatment when they started on integrase inhibitors. Um, and the proportion uh, who were art experienced and virologically suppressed at the integrase inhibitor start varied from 26% for those on raltegravir to 50% on dolutegravir, 63% on elvitegravir. So among those who were on integrase inhibitors at 12 and 24 months, this shows you the time since integrase inhibitors start and the rate of viral suppression, 80% were virally suppressed in those who received dolutegravir in dark blue and elvitegravir in light blue, compared to only 69 to 71% in those receiving raltegravir in the kind of brownish color. Then if we look at children who were art experienced and viremic at the time integrase inhibitors start, they had lower rates of suppression, 50 to 66% than those who were antiretroviral naive or art experienced and virally suppressed at the time of integrase inhibitor. Um, so you can compare here. So overall, one in four children were on integrase inhibitors, variation by region, greater than 80% viral suppression on dolutegravir or elvitegravir. Uh, but note, as in the other two studies, suppression was lower among those who were art experienced and viremic at the time they switched to integrase inhibitors. So this gives us some caution about dolutegravir resistance. So what do we know from other studies? The Odyssey trial in children and adolescents showed viral superiority of dolutegravir to standard of care. And while none of the patients getting first-line dolutegravir treatment who had viral failure had dolutegravir resistance, 18% of the patients who were on second-line dolutegravir had, uh, and had viral failure had dolutegravir resistance. And IMPACT 1093 was a pharmacokinetic study assessing dolutegravir in 142 art experienced children. 22% with viral failure on dolutegravir developed resistance. And all of those who had resistance had viremia at the time of dolutegravir initiation. And six of the eight had had an initial viral response to dolutegravir. So while the risk of resistance when you switch to dolutegravir in children with viral failure remains relatively low, as in the Mozambique study, children who are viremic at the time of the switch may be the group at greater risk of developing dolutegravir resistance and require more intense follow-up. Uh, this next study comes from Nigeria using routine clinical records from 156 five, uh, health facilities in two states to evaluate the viral response in over 2,300 children transitioned to dolutegravir as of December 2021. Median age was six years, 51% females, and at baseline, 82% uh, were undetectable, 15% had low-level viremia, and 4% were unsuppressed. This is prior to the transition. Of the 2,148 children who remained on treatment after 12 months, most of the children, 91% were undetectable, 7% had low-level viremia, and only 3% were unsuppressed. And there was no difference in viral response by sex. 
So an improved viral response was observed in children living with HIV after the Dalyotergavir transition in Nigeria. Uh, this study came from the IDEA cohorts and evaluated weight and BMI for change following dolutegravir transition in adolescents with HIV in West Africa who had at least one available weight before and after dolutegravir start. Um, so, uh, 1,159 had available weight data. Um, uh, before or at the time of transition, only 178 had available weight data three months after. Um, most uh, were female, 58%. Median age at start of treatment was three years. Median duration prior to switching to dietegravir was 10 years. And the median age at the time of transition was 13. So this looks at weight gain per month before transition and after transition. And basically the rate of weight gain per kilogram per month was similar between those prior to dolutegravir initiation and after dolutegravir initiation, 0.147 and 0.125. And you can see the mean weight same thing for BMI, uh, BMI for age Z score, no significant difference in the increase. So they did not see any excessive weight or BMI gain after dolutegravir transition in these adolescents, but it, a note that the sample size was small and follow-up following dolutegravir was short, and they plan to continue to monitor this for trends. Uh, this study was uh, the DANCE study, which is an ongoing single arm study evaluating dual treatment with dolutegravir and 3TC in art naive adolescents, 32 adolescents, median age 17 years, uh, from nine centers in Thailand, Kenya, and South Africa. Of note, one site closed due to non compliance with GCP, so they did a sensitivity analysis that excluded these seven patients. And they're giving us the results of a secondary endpoint at week 196 at one week 96. So this looks at viral response to less than 50 through week 196, um, with the red being the sensitivity analysis where they've excluded this one site. Um, overall, 69% were suppressed at week 96. 96. Um, and in the sensitivity analysis, this was 88%. So comparing the data from the virologic data from DANCE to the adult Gemini study, you can see that the efficacy was somewhat less overall, 69% versus 88 and 86%. When they compared adverse events, most adverse events were grade one and two. Um, for SAE, none were related to study drug and not really much difference between the pediatric and the adult study. So dolutegravir 3TC was well tolerated, had relatively high efficacy if you exclude the uh, problematic site, and no resistance was observed in those who had viral failure. Only one had viral failure through week 96. So this is small numbers, but do support a further study of dual treatment with dolutegravir 3TC in adolescents as a first-line option. And another PENTA study is evaluating dual treatment in children who are 2 to 15. Um, so this is another adult study that has relevance to children and looks at the effect of unplanned treatment care interruption uh, on people's restarting treatment. So it's a survival analysis in South Africa of over 63,000 adults starting treatment between 2004 to 2019. Demographics are shown here. Um, so care interruption was defined as 180 days with no contact, and then they returned to care. So we're looking at the outcomes of those who returned to care. And then for the first interruption, it was divided into an early interruption starting at less than six months post-starting treatment versus a late interruption at uh, six or more months starting treatment. 
So this looks at mortality by art interruption status. No interruption is light blue. Early interruption is the orange. Late interruption is green. And you can see the KM curve here. And you can see that compared to no interruption, there was a 2.3 fold increased risk of mortality in those who had early interruption and a 1.9 fold increased risk of mortality in those who had a late interruption. Uh, this looks at uh, by duration of interruption stratified by early and late interruption. And those who had a longer interruption clearly had a higher risk of mortality, with this being higher in the early than the late interrupters. So care interruption doubled the risk of mortality and even late interruption after receiving six months or more uh, was associated with increased mortality. This increase in mortality increased as the duration of the interruption increased. And although this is data from adults, one might expect that we would see the same in children. And this study comes from PEPFAR in South Africa, looking at trends in art continuity in children. So it's a five-year period looking from January 2018 to September 2022 in 14 districts in South Africa. So first in the red boxes, you can see there was a 57% increase in uh, art initiation between March 2018 and March 2020, but then a 21% decrease uh, to 2022, despite 30,000 new art initiations in the same period. And this was not due to mortality, which accounted for only a small portion of the loss changing definitions of, uh, of loss complicated interpretation. And they felt that some program losses could be accounted for um, with an expected decrease in new infections and by aging out of children. Uh, they also felt morbidity of the population played a part in art interruptions, uh, which was marked by seasonality with a 6 to 8% interruption during the holiday months, as you see in the red circles here, compared to 3 to 5% during non-holiday months. So these results highlight the complexities in program retention for children with HIV, underscore the need for enhanced program data to improve continuity of care, and the need to standardize reporting systems to ensure precision and accuracy. Also suggests that there are you know, decreases in continuity of care for children as there were for adults. This uh, presentation, looked at the Orphans and Vulnerable Children program in Ethiopia using routine clinical data, and they compared the uh, 364 orphans and vulnerable children to 429 children who were not in Orphans and Vulnerable Children programs from the same clinic, all receiving treatment. So all had the same care, but the Orphans and Vulnerable Children had additional care, as you'll see on the next slide. Mean age was 12 years, and viral suppression was the endpoint. So this looks at viral suppression and those on the OVC program versus the non-OVC programs with viral suppression shown in blue. And you can see that those in the OVC program were more likely to have viral suppression than those not in the OVC program, 98, 98 versus 90%. This looks at missed appointments in the last six uh, months, and you can see that the OVC program had a 23% uh, decreased risk of missing clinic appointments, that's the green, uh, compared to patients not in the OVC program. This looks at missed on-time art pickup. Very similarly, the light blue is missed on-time art pickup. OVC program had a 23% decreased risk of missing art um, pickup. And this looks at viral load measurement. And you can see that the non-OVC program patients had a sevenfold greater risk of not having a viral load measurement in the past six months. So that's comparing here uh, to the OVC program. 
And this looks at the HIV testing cascade, number of study participants, number receiving treatment, very similar between the two eligible for viral load measurements, again, very similar, but having a viral load measurements and having a suppressed viral load was better for the OVC children. So compared to children in clinical care alone, children both receiving the clinical care program and the OBC program had better viral suppression, clinic and art pickup, uh, adherence, and viral load measurements. And so what were the advantages of being in the OVC program? So you can see the OVC program provided a number of additional services in addition to that seen in the clinic program, including linkage to community-based testing and counseling, um, treatment support, um, regular household visits for adherence support, and the family got psychosocial and comprehensive support. And this shows you the types of services that were provided and that were taken by the OVC program participants with the top five services uh, used were support with HIV treatment and adherence, school assisted, hygiene and insurance, and insecticide treatment nets. This study then is from Zimbabwe and looked at um, a viral suppression in perinatally infected adults compared to behaviorally infected adults, a population-based cross-sectional survey over 17,000 young people in uh, 24 communities in Zimbabwe. 435 self-reported they were HIV positive, 196 with perinatal infection, 239 with behavioral acquisition. So overall, 61% were female with a mean age of 20 years. Youth with behavioral HIV were more likely female, age 20 to 24 years, uh, diagnosed at an older age and lower socioeconomic status. Youth with perinatal HIV were more likely to have stunting, less likely to have had sexual debut, be married or be pregnant, and high, had a higher prevalence of TB. And most importantly, youth with perinatal HIV were almost two times as likely to have an unsuppressed viral load when you adjusted for different factors compared to those with behavioral acquisition. So young people with perinatal HIV had worse health outcomes and a greater risk of viral non-suppression and likely need more intensive special uh, follow-up. Uh, this study looked at characteristics associated with HIV-related related inpatient hospital deaths in children in Zambia in 2021. There were 148 deaths. Of the 148 deaths, 60% were in HIV-exposed infants, of which 53% had not received any treatment for PMTCT. Um, HIV uh, was confirmed in 41% of the deaths, with 28% of these kids never started on treatment. 53% had moderate to severe malnutrition, mixed breastfeeding in 34% with no breastfeeding in 16%, median age of admission was 10 months, and median duration from admission to death was seven days. The primary cause of death was respiratory diseases in 58%, with infectious and parasitic diseases in 10%. So most HIV in hospital related deaths occurred in children aged less than 24 months and almost 50% had not received any ARVs for either treatment or prevention. Most deaths were due to respiratory diseases. So now I'm going to move to presentations on a PMTCT cascade with the first study being factors associated with breast uh, milk transmission in the art era. And this was a retrospective study of over 50,000 infants in the Western Cape born between 19, uh, 2018 and 2021, and then followed up through August 2022. Um, maternal treatment, 51% had received treatment before pregnancy, 27% started during pregnancy. 
6% had no treatment. Most were treated, mothers were treated with NNRTIs. And at delivery, uh, most mothers had viral load less than 1,000 and a good CD4 count. A mother-to-child transmission rate was 1.8%, 894 children. Of the transmission, 0.9% was in utero, 0.4% was interpartum, with the vast majority of transmission, 1.5%, being breastfeeding. They evaluated risk factors for breastfeeding in mothers who were known to be HIV positive at delivery with infants diagnosed at HIV at grade, age greater than three months. Younger maternal age was associated with uh, breast milk transmission, higher parity, and shown in the chart here, inconsistent treatment use during pregnancy with uh, starting before pregnancy, but having gaps, starting during pregnancy and having gaps or receiving no treatment, as you can see. Lower CD4 increased risk and importantly, higher viral load increased risk, as well as having unknown viral load. Uh, this looks at maternal HIV retesting in South Africa, and they evaluated data reported for visit one in the antenatal clinic and post visit one antenatal clinic HIV testing in PEPFAR data in 15 USAID supported districts in South Africa. So this looks at annual number of pregnant women receiving HIV testing at a ANC1 and the rate of test positivity. So despite decrease in ANC1 testing uh, volume and HIV positivity rate comparing fiscal year 19 to fiscal year 22, the coverage of testing remained greater than 98%. Um, and those already on ART at the time that they went into ANC, so were on ART prior to coming into antenatal care, uh, increased. So this looks at the annual number of pregnant women receiving tested testing at post-ANC. Post-ANC testing increased between 15 uh, fiscal year 2019 and 22 by 56%. Positivity rate, however, decreased from 0.9% to 0.3%. And this looks at the annual postnatal ANC coverage and the ratio of ANC1 to post-ANC1 uh, testing. Now, remember, post-ANC testing is not just one time. It's during breastfeeding and it's supposed to be happening multiple times. So the ratio of testing at the first antenatal visit to testing at the postnatal visit should be increasing over time. And indeed, that's what they saw. Fiscal year 19, the ratio was 1 to 1.1, increased in fiscal year 22 to 1 to 2.1. But this is clearly having incomplete adherence of testing during the breastfeeding period because repeated breastfeeding testing should result in a higher ratio. This would mean that there were two uh, testings post ANC1, whereas if you're testing every six months during breastfeeding, this should be more like three or four. Uh, infant HIV positivity rate at two months was stable at 0.6, but at 12 months, you saw a slight increase from fiscal year 2019, 0.8% to 0.9% in fiscal year 2022. So there's progress in post-ANC testing, but need to closely monitor retesting during the breastfeeding period. Goes along with the data that we just talked about with factors associated with uh, breastfeeding transmission. Uh, so this was a model, a micro simulation model to estimate the impact of viral load testing and mentor mothers on transmission in a high HIV prevalence setting and de de describes a hypothetical cohort of women with recent HIV starting treatment in pregnancy and looking at uh, pregnancy and breastfeeding and the risk of mother to child transmission. So with no viral load testing, no mentor mothers, they're assuming that dilutegravir is started at five months gestational age, the risk of viral failure is 9%, and the risk of loss to follow-up is 25%. 
So what happens with viral load testing? They looked at 50 or 100% adherence to viral load testing, assuming that viral load is done three months after antiretroviral start, and then every six months during breastfeeding, they assume 50% resuppress re with counseling and no switch to second line if repeat viral load is unsuppressed. So these are the assumptions there. With mentor mothers, they assume no change in the other parameters, but a decrease in loss to follow up from 25 to 10%. So they evaluated six strategies with these assumptions, including no testing, uh, viral load testing 50%, 100%, mentor mothers, and then combined mentor mothers and viral load testing. So what did they find? They found first a limited impact of viral load testing, a 0.1 to 0.5% reduction in uh, mother to child transmission. They found that mentor mothers had a greater impact than viral load testing with an 11.7% reduction in transmission, and that concurrent implementation of both had the greatest uh, impact, up to 12% reduction. So why was there a limited impact of viral load testing? Well, viral load testing can only approve outcomes for mothers who are A, retained in care, and to have <clears throat> unsuppressed viral load only a small proportion of the women had unsuppressed viral load. So if the rate of viral failure is higher, viral load testing impact would be higher. But the greater impact of mentor mothers was because they intervene further upstream in the cascade. That is, they're preventing loss to follow up. And so they have the potential to impact a larger proportion of mothers than did viral load testing. Uh, they found the greatest impact was with combination of mentor mothers and viral load testing, but note that they didn't account for potential enhanced infant prophylaxis if the mother was viremic, but a small percent were only viremic in pregnancy. So mentor mothers had a big impact, potential impact. This looks at factors associated with um, acceptance of PrEP, HIV self-testing, or combined PrEP, HIV self-testing using data from the PRIMA study in Kenya. There were 911 high-risk women offered HIV self-testing for a male partner who had unknown HIV status, and they were also offered PrEP. Characteristics are shown in the box here. Um, HIV self-testing was actually more acceptable than PrEP, with 55% uh, accepting HIV self-testing alone, um, HIV self-testing in PrEP in 14%, PrEP alone in 4%, none in 27%. They found that HIV self-testing increased male partners' HIV awareness from 5 to 82%. You can see 84% offered self-testing to their partner, 78% of the partners took it, 76% of the women and men tested together with a 1% positivity rate. And so this increased couple testing as well as increased knowledge of male partner status. Reasons for accepting or declining HIV self-testing and PrEP are shown here. Um, accepting HIV self-testing at enrollment, 69%. Those who declined said they need to consult their partner, their partner was away, or they feared intimate partner violence. This looks at factors uh, with accepting PrEP at enrollment. Um, those who had unknown uh, partner HIV status were more likely to accept PrEP. Those who didn't accept PrEP in enrollment, they said they needed to consult their partner. Um, a significant portion had a low HIV risk perception. And this looks at covariates of what was associated with interventions accepted. So being married, having a history of IPV, a suspicion that the male partner had other sexual partners were associated with dual acceptance. Um, these factors plus low social support, not residing with partner, longer duration of living with partner was associated with accepting PrEP only and higher level of education and residing with the partner was associated with HIV self-testing only. 
So awareness of male partner HIV status guides female HIV prevention decisions and low HIV risk perception may hinder acceptance of both HIV self-testing and PrEP and women were unwilling or unable to negotiate HIV self-testing preferred PrEP alone. Uh, this is the Know Your Child Status uh, Study. Uh, USAID rolled out the Know Your Child Status Study to 173 project sites in Zambia. Uh, this study obtained a line listing of all women with HIV on treatment and then pulled biologic and non-biologic children living with them aged less than 19 years and provided resources at the sites to facilitate HIV testing of these children. So over 30,000, 85 percent of the women accepted line listing, um, which elicited an average of 1.85 1.8 child per women contacts. Um, so here we have the women. Here are the contacts in blue. Only 24,513 or 43% of these child contacts had known HIV status. Of the 28 over 28,000 contacts with unknown status, 90% got tested. They identified 903 children with HIV with a 1.5% yield, all of whom were linked to treatment. Note the median age of identified, newly identified children with HIV was 15 years. Uh, female uh, child contacts were 1.5 times more likely to test positive than males, as female adolescents were three times more likely to test positive than male counterparts. So know your child status requires a large volume of HIV testing to find HIV positive patients, but was a crucial and successful strategy to ensure, ensure that no child or adolescent was left behind with unknown status. This looks at unconfirmed positive uh, HIV testing in children with perinatal exposure. So as vertical transmission declines with maternal treatment, the predictive value of a single infant positive PCR decreases with the probability of a false positive result uh, increasing. Therefore, all tests should have confirmatory testing to avoid misdiagnosis and unnecessary starting of treatment on, uh, on treatment. So what they did was they looked at IDEA African infants born between 2004 and 2011 and evaluated the prevalence of unconfirmed tests. An unconfirmed positive is an infant who had only one positive test at age less than 18 months and no additional testing at uh, 18 months or older. So of 72,000 over 72,000 perinatally exposed infants, 3,652, 5% had one or more positive tests. Of those children, 44% lacked a confirmatory test at less than 18 months, with most of them, 87%, never repeating the test. Uh, this varied by region, as you can see here, with 91% unconfirmed in the Western region compared to 13% uh, unconfirmed in the Southern African region. Um, happily, the unconfirmed prevalence decreased over time in all of the countries, although Central Africa and uh, East Africa remained having the highest percentage with unconfirmed test. So unconfirmed single positive test is highly prevalent and additional efforts are needed to ensure that confirmatory testing is done to reduce the risk of false positive testing. Uh, this is a birth surveillance study in Eswatini that is like the Tsambo study in Botswana, birth defect surveillance at the highest uh, five highest volume maternity sites in all four regions of Eswatini, covering 73% of all births. Of the over 35,000 pregnant women involved in the uh, birth surveillance, 30% were HIV positive, the majority of whom 89% received dolutegravir treatment, most received it preconception, a number starting during pregnancy. 
um, about 1,600 were on non-dilutegravir treatment at conception, most on efavirenz. So this looks at birth outcomes. This shows you the number of women delivering, single live births, the number of major birth defects, neural tube defects, stillbirths, low birth weight, and preterm delivery. So there was no significant difference in major birth defect prevalence by HIV status, 0.4% HIV negative, 0.4% HIV positive. Neural tube defects were non-significantly higher in HIV positive women, 0.11 compared to 0.08 in HIV negative women. Compared to HIV negative women, HIV positive women had an increased risk of stillbirth, an increased risk of low birth weight, and an increased risk of preterm delivery. And this is despite being on treatment. When you looked at HIV positive women, there was no significant difference between dilutegravir and non-dilutegravir at conception for major birth defects, stillbirth, low birth weight, or preterm delivery. Neural tube defects were higher in the non-dilutegravir than the dilutegravir at conception group, but the number of exposures were much smaller. So most HIV positive women in East Watini are receiving dilutegravir art, most starting preconception. But despite being on treatment, HIV positive women had slightly higher adverse pregnancy outcomes with no evidence that this was higher with dilutegravir compared to non-dilutegravir. And this has been seen in a number of studies uh, that despite the treatment, adverse pregnancy outcomes may continue to be increased in HIV positive compared to negative women. Moving on to discussing uh, PrEP studies. The first study looked at the potential acceptability of offering differentiated community-based PrEP in uh, pregnant and postpartum women enrolled in ongoing PrEP trials in South Africa and uh, Kenya. So that is distribution in community settings as shown here. This looks at the participant characteristics. The median age was 28 years. 50% um, had used injectable contraceptives, 83% some secondary school, 79% not employed. There was a difference between the Kenya and South Africa cohorts in a number of these factors. So when asked, would you be interested in accessing your HIV prevention product through community delivery outside a clinic or hospital, um, you can see 59% were not interested, 41% were interested. And that this differed between South Africa and Kenya with much more interest in community delivery, the light gray in South Africa than in Kenya. The most frequent reason for preferring differentiated uh, prep uh, delivery was convenience, uh, with the most frequent reason for preferring the clinic rather than community was privacy or the wanting to see a clinical provider. Predictors of community prep delivery preference was younger age, internalized PrEP stigma, and disliking oral PrEP side effects. Negative predictors of preferring community delivery were Kenyan site and having one or more sexual partners. So this shows the importance of offering a choice of community and clinic options for PrEP pickup and the need for context-specific strategies, which varied by country. And the next couple of things will show this as well. Um, this is looking at anticipated preferences for long-acting contraception. Kenya is using a private pharmacies for differentiated PrEP delivery with an ongoing pilot study in Kasumu and Kababi. Um, and you can see this is where the client expresses interest in PrEP. The, in the pharmacy, a provider room accesses PrEP um, eligibility using a checklist and eligible patients can get PrEP and be scheduled for follow-up at the pharmacy. So they looked at 496 PrEP clients at month one regarding the preference for oral PrEP, injectable PrEP, or the vaginal ring if they were female. 50% of these clients were female and less than 25 years. 
uh, seventy five percent unmarried, eighty five percent were had been prep naive. So you can see that sixty five percent of respondents would. Uh, prefer injection over oral pill. And when they looked at by, by male versus female in age, uh, females over 25 uh, years were significantly more likely to prefer injection than uh, younger females or males. Factors associated with preferring injectables was age and whether they were seen in Kasumu. Um, if this is looking at females only now, 58% uh, ranked injectable prep first and the oral pill second, 30% ranked the oral pill first and injectable prep second, and only two listed the depivirine ring as a first choice, which is interesting considering uh, a study I'll talk about in a moment. So most, but not all clients indicated a preference for injectable PrEP and that this varied among subgroups. So again, this indicates the importance of offering choice, offering both oral PrEP as well as injectable PrEP as choices for people who are at risk of HIV. This looked at the acceptability of CAB LA in uh, South Africa, Uganda, and Zimbabwe in adolescence. So this was a single arm study in 55 adolescents in three countries. They started with oral CAB, moved to injection CAB, and at 48 weeks, they were told they could choose either uh, injection CAB or oral TDF to continue. So at 48 weeks, 92% chose to receive injectable uh, CAB. They did qualitative in-depth interviews with 15 patients and 15 uh, parents, and facilitators emerged, um, including lack of adherence, challenges with injectable discretion, knowledge of efficacy, the administration mode, and parent-guardian buy-in. Barriers included having injection site uh, reactions, fear of injections, and side effects. So CAB LA was highly acceptable to adolescent girls and young women, 92% uh, choosing to stay on it. Most felt the benefits outweighed the pain of injection. But again, here, choice matters. Some patients still preferred receiving oral tablets for a variety of reasons. Uh, and the barriers and facilitators with future clients should be discussed as part of decision making. So again, the theme of choice. Uh, so this comes from the HPTN study, open label uh, extension, looking at assessment of PrEP choice, either CAB LA or oral TDF FTC, the reasons for the choice and factors associated with the choice during this open label extension when the women enrolled in the study could choose which they could get. So almost 2,500 participated in this. 78% chose to receive CAB LA. And interestingly enough, this varied by arm with more choosing to receive CAB LA who started uh, by getting the, who were randomized to the CAB LA arm than those who were randomized to the oral prep arm. Uh, product choice actually varied between country, 92% in Botswana choosing to receive CAB compared to 69% in Uganda. This looks at participant characteristics by product choice. Those who chose CAB appeared to be at greater risk of HIV, more likely not to live with their partner, have recent intimate partner violence, and to have been paid for sex. Uh, if you were pregnant, 68% chose to receive CAB anyway. Reasons for product choice are shown here for CAB. Most preferred injections and didn't like pills, 78%, whereas for the oral, they preferred pills and didn't like injections in 81%. So most chose CAB. Product choice was influenced by personal preference for product attributes, risk behavior, social geographic context. And again, this shows the importance of having a choice of products available. Um, 
This was a uh, cost effectiveness analysis of tenofovir oral prep versus injectable prep in adolescent girls uh, 15 to 30 years in South Africa over a 10 year period using the CPEC model. They evaluated the highest annual price called the maximal price premium, where KBLA has an incremental cost ratio or ICER uh, less than 3,500, which is 50% of South Africa's per capita annual GDP. And when it's less than that, it's viewed as cost effective. This were their assumptions when they went in, in terms of mean age of 26 years, HIV incidence uh, based on the clinical trials, retention based on the clinical trials, and cost. So they were uh, uh, averaging a cost of $40 for the oral prep versus $80 for the cab prep, and then they varied this over time. So this shows you that the iCEDAR with CAB LA just met the incremental cost effectiveness ratio when it was $40 more than, um, than oral prep. So that gives you an $80 cost. And this looks at the, the uh, tenofovir FTC cost compared to the CAB LA cost and, uh, and what happens in terms of being cost saving, being within the ICR or not cost saving. So for CAB LA to be cost effective for adolescent girls and young women in South Africa, here in the white box is what we saw above here, it needs to be priced as no more than twice that of tenofovir FTC or $80. Costing more, it becomes not cost effective. Costing less, it becomes cost savings. Uh, this is an interesting study on depivirine ring acceptance coming from Zimbabwe, uh, looking at adolescent girls and young women in eight districts. Um, that they were offered either the depivirine ring or oral prep. More talk took the depivirine ring than oral prep, and they were then followed up monthly. There was high depivirine ring acceptability, 76%, uh, rural more than oral, urban. Um, Self-insertion of the ring increased over time. Interestingly, PrEP continuation rates with the depivirine ring shown in yellow were much higher than PrEP continuation rates of oral PrEP in blue. This looks at HIV incidence, and HIV incidence was actually not significantly different than with oral PrEP and very similar to other studies of the depivirine ring. And most seroconversions with the depivirine ring occurred in the first month. And after the first month, it was in patients who reported removing the ring and having unprotected sex. So in this study, at least, there was high acceptability of the depivirine ring. Um, higher continuation rates than oral PrEP and comparable HIV seroconversion. So you can see there's a big difference between countries in terms of depivirine ring acceptance. Uh, so we're going to end with talking about abstracts of adolescence and HIV. Um, this is looking at the prevalence of intimate partner violence in the DREAMS project in Zimbabwe reported by 43%, was a qualitative study, 282 sexually active adolescent girls, uh, characteristics shown here. 14.9% reported they had experienced intimate partner violence of a variety of different kinds, shown here. Predictors of intimate partner violence was being married and urban, peri-urban. They talked about actions taken by community leaders, and in these particular areas and dreams, they had a significant number of actions that actually were took place to decrease intimate partner violence. They, so they saw a lower prevalence of IPV than prior reports, possibly attributable to these community interventions as shown here, and IPV was most common in married women in rural settings. This looked at new infections in teen pregnancies in DREAMS compared to non-DREAMS districts in Malawi. 
So dreams is shown in purple, non-dreams is shown in green, and this is looking at new HIV diagnoses. Dreams districts had a 77.8% decrease in new HIV diagnoses compared to only 58% in non-DREAMS districts with a significant difference in the percent change in new infections between DREAMS and non-DREAMS districts. This looks at the proportion of uh, teenage pregnancies. Again, DREAMS is purple, non-DREAMS is green. Uh, DREAMS districts had a 12% decrease in teen pregnancies over time compared to a 7% in non-DREAMS districts. This difference, however, was not significantly different. Uh, and this is a cluster, this is the last couple of uh, presentations, a cluster randomized study to evaluate the impact of a sports-based demand generating program called SKILLS on uptake of HIV testing and contraception by girls. And they randomized 46 schools in Zambia, and then they did a self-administered survey at baseline six and 12 months. And over here on the right, you see uh, exactly what the skills intervention involved. This looks at baseline characteristics at control versus treatment schools. Uh, 20% had recent contraception, 37% overall had been tested within the last 12 months, not much difference between treatment and control. So this looked at the impact uh, of the program on HIV testing and contraception uptake. HIV testing shown in dark blue, contraception in blue. So here you see baseline and six month data for the control arm and baseline and six month data for the treatment arm. Uh, and there was a 27% uh, increase percentage points in HIV testing in the program compared to the control arm, 12% increase in contraception. So both an increase in HIV testing and contraception was observed with this particular program con compared to the control. So they then did a process evaluation at 23 schools to characterize the attendance changes in HIV and sexual and reproductive health knowledge from pre to post test. So of the over 1100 girls at the intervention site, 79% had attended at least one session of which 90% attended at least eight of 12 sessions. Mean attendance varied by school, not correlated with prior testing. And you can see uh, pre in blue, post-test in red, a significant uh, increase in post-test knowledge of HIV and SRH knowledge. So the program was well attended, led to large knowledge gains in both HIV and SRH. And as you saw in the prior slide, also increase in HIV testing and contraception. Uh, this is the last one. This is a cluster randomized trial of a community-based integrated HIV and sexual reproductive services for youth in Zimbabwe called CHIDZA. Um, and this involved having youth as partners in the design and delivery, offered multiple types of services with ongoing community engagement, and you can see the types of services in the box. They had high attendance and uptake of multiple services, so over almost 37,000 clients, 79,000 visits over time, and you can see that a number of different services uh, were taken up over time with the top six being menstrual health uh, management, HIV testing, SMS contraception, pain management, and condoms. And this varied in females. Most commonly, you saw menstrual health management, contraception, HIV testing, and males, HIV testing, condoms, and SMS messaging on sexual and reproductive health with a big overlap in terms of use. HIV testing was highly accepted by both males and females. Um, and you can see that overall 84% ever had a test at this. Um, and this was very similar in males and females. And this was likely driven by provision and acceptance of other services other than HIV testing. Um, 
this is a study that introduced self-testing and different distribution models in Uganda. Uh, and this included key populations, including sex worker clinics, hotspots, and index testing, public sector, uh, private sector, including workplace, pharmacies, and nurse clinics, and community, education, community outreach, and door-to-door. -door. They had multiple options for uh, testing services. They had peer-demanded, driven demand, uh, and various cadres of healthcare worker training in this particular study. Over 3,000, uh, 203,000 people received HIV self-testing kits. They were targeting adolescent girls uh, and they had very good acceptance. Reactivity, testing positivity, art linkage, and art initiation were very similar with the adolescent girls and the overall group. Over two thirds of the HIV self-testing uh, kits were distributed to the group that they wanted, adolescent and uh, uh, young women, 2024. 67% preferred unassisted self-testing and 50% had not been tested in the past 12 months. Community models had the greatest volume of adolescent girls, uh, including door-to-door -door and targeting. Uh, as shown in the orange here. Uh, and when you looked at uh, HIV positivity rates, the private sector had the highest testing positivity rate with the testing positivity rate of 5.6% compared to 0.7% in the community. Among adolescent girls who had never been tested, 86% were reached through community and private sector models, including the hotspots and nurse-led clinics. So community, particularly peer-driven and private sector models were most effective at reaching adolescent girls and young women with testing services and identifying HIV positive uh, young people. Um, and peers led to high linkage rates. Yes, and that is the end. And we have about 10 to 15 minutes for questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Mofinson. Um, Dr. Shafika Saji, Senior Advisor for HIV at UNICEF, uh, will now be taking on some questions for you. Thank you very much, Karthi, and thank you to Lynn for your extraordinary tour de force. As usual, you've covered so much uh, ground uh, and in so much detail. Um, and just to respond to some of the questions in the chat, uh, Dr. Sanjay, these slides we've made available right after this webinar. You'll be able to download them as usual from the childrenandaids.org website. And as Lynn noted at the beginning of the presentation, there'll be two slide decks, one which, which you've just seen, and another that contains a slightly more extensive set of slides, including a set of slides on HIV uh, uh, exposed but uninfected infants, which we didn't really have time to cover during this presentation, but which Lynn did prepare some slides for. So please do go back to the, to the uh, website. You'll, you'll find the, the, the presentations there. And please do take a look at the HEU material um, that uh, Lynn has prepared, but which we didn't present. Um, a couple of commentators also noted on the value of having a French uh, simultaneous translation of this. Uh, that's a point very well taken. Uh, we have not done that in the past, and I think um, we need to ensure that we are being more inclusive of our Francophone colleagues, especially from West and Central Africa. So uh, point very well taken. Um, Dr. Sanjay, you asked about mental mothers and uh, 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 wanted a little bit more explanation about mental mothers. And I think this was in relation to the impact of uh, uh, viral load testing versus mental mother interventions on outcomes such as retention and viral suppression. So Lynn, maybe that could be our first question. Could you elaborate a little bit on mental mothers in the context of that study? Yes, I believe the mentor mothers uh, both provided in clinic, uh, you know, uh, peer um, discussion, but also provided uh, home visits. 
uh, and went out and, uh, and, and assisted in terms of obtaining follow-up. So we had both clinic-based and community-based work done by HIV-positive women who'd been through a pregnancy before to be able to support the new HIV-positive pregnant women in the, in the site. Thank you, Lynn. And of course, mental mothers are uh, uh, something of a backbone of PMTCT programming across many countries in sub-Saharan Africa, where we've recognized the value that peers can have putting their colleagues to maintain adherence, retention and care and improve outcomes for their, their, their children. Uh, I'm going to read from some of the questions in the Q&A chat box. Zikiti asks, women living with HIV in South Africa stop breastfeeding early. About 20 to 30 percent of these women stop before four months of age. Are there settings with similar experience and are there interventions to sustain breastfeeding in this population? Lynn, I think that's a challenging question, but uh, uh, what, what would you what would you say? Yeah, well, I, I can't I can't directly address that from the presentations from the meeting. Um, so I'm not sure I can actually answer it, Shafiq. I think it. I think the duration of breastfeeding really varies between countries. With some countries going to 24 months, and some like in South Africa going lower. And it may have to do with the availability of, you know, uh, breast milk substitutes. I, I'm not sure. Maybe you have a better idea than I do. <laughs> I I I was. Uh, uh, Hoping you were going to come up with. I, I think. I think you know, Maureen, these are, This is a, a, a challenging issue, um, and I think in part we in the HIV community have been sort of responsible for the reluctance of pregnant women to breastfeed because we've we told them for years that you can transmit using breastfeeding, and we sort of gave an option that if if it's affordable and feasible for you then you should do formula feeding uh, in order to uh, uh, minimize the risk of transmission. Uh, and I think we've not made that transition fully into the new discourse, which says it is actually very safe to breastfeed and, and prolonged breastfeeding is healthy for your child, um, uh, at least for up to six months. Uh, and you can do so very safely if you are suppressed on antiretroviral treatment. So I think I think I think you make a, a valid point about the need to kind of re-emphasize um, the science and what we know about breastfeeding in the context of HIV. Uh, and I'm sure that that's part of the reason why women stop breastfeeding. Yeah, it's uh, a good it's a, a good question. point. Just <clears throat> Just a quick yeah. comment in terms of um, it, it's important to emphasize to women, I think, that if they remain suppressed, the risk of transmission through breastfeeding is near zero. It's not completely zero. There are rare case reports, but it's near zero. Uh, so it's, it's a kind of U equals U setting, and, and that can help, I think, to encourage women to continue to breastfeed as long as they're taking treatment. Yeah, uh, there's a question in the Q&A from Ugo Amanyewe, who complains that he's being called Kalda, but he's obviously <laughs> not Kalda. Um, Ugo, um, robust integrated community programming seems to be the way forwards towards achieving the epidemic control and improving access for youth and children. Are there any intentional strategic policies and actions being put in place to encourage such agile and sustainable interventions to be promoted as the norm. So I think your question is about saying, you know, we've got all of this evidence that talks about how community-based efforts, whether it's the mentor mothers that we were talking about earlier, or community outreach to find and retain women in care, seems to be the way forwards. To what extent are we seeing that being placed front and center in terms of, of, of policies and interventions? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question that um, I can't necessarily really answer, but I would hope that, 
you know, PEPFAR funding would encourage this. Um, uh, and, and as you said, a, a number of the studies that I presented showed the benefits of having comprehensive care. I think the orphan and vulnerable children presentation in particular showed tremendous improvements when you just added a few things to the standard clinical care. Yes, and Ugo, you added a further comment to say why they're nascent and not the norm. Um, I think, I think you know, nascent is perhaps the wrong word because there's literally been decades of experience and learning and programming related to community interventions. Uh, why is it not the norm yet? Uh, again, I think we're still stuck in a medicalized model of how we manage HIV. We recognize the importance of community health in broader uh, primary healthcare delivery, but HIV services have been siloed for a long time. And I feel like we've not really adopted and absorbed some of those lessons from primary healthcare fully into HIV, even though we have ample experience. So this is definitely a frontier where we need to uh, advance more progress. Um, I, uh, uh, I think we're out of time, unfortunately. Um, but, but as usual, there were many comments and uh, questions that, that people had. Um, and I would invite you all to continue uh, 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 posting your comments through our uh, community of practice. Um, and uh, 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 would, would, would love to um, you know, get your further feedback on this and on ways in which we could improve these webinars going forward. Um, so with that, uh, I'd like to thank all of you for joining, Lynn, especially to you for your fantastic work as usual. Um, and uh, uh, to all of our uh, uh, participants, uh, have a fantastic day. Please use this knowledge in your programming uh, in your policy making and in your practice. Thanks Thank everybody you. for attending. <laughs> Bye. Bye, -bye everyone.